the reason we thought it was the right time to focus on disruptive innovation is because it's a unique time in technological economic history. You really have to go back a century to see the, num the amount of technological foment that's happening today. A century ago, it was the telephone electrification and the internal combustion engine. Today, we think there are five you know, fundamental innovation platforms. The way I think about it is future historians will look back upon this time period and say, oh my gosh, gene sequencing and editing, uh, AI and neural nets, collaborative robots, uh, energy storage, particularly working through the drivetrain and mobility space, and cryptocurrency were all hitting critical stages of inflection and cross-sector penetration, all in the same market cycle. And, and it's really unprecedented. And, and actually, there's a lot of value creation happening as a result of that. Uh, and, and, and so kind of within the context of asset management, you should focus on the area where the most value is being created. And so from, from our perspective, it seemed natural that you would wanna set up portfolio management and research to focus on exactly that most fertile terrain for both value creation and misunderstanding. And so kind of those are the five technology platforms that we think future historians will say that was as big as computation or, or as big as the internet. Uh, and, and we use a framework for identifying those where they, they all follow steep cost declines. They all are cross-sector technologies. And actually that's a strong um, kind of test for whether or not something's ready for a critical stage of inflection. A steep cost decline doesn't manifest in three or six months. It's actually the drama of the unit demand you get is, is over a medium term time horizon. But Wall Street, for all kinds of reasons I could go into, is increasingly time compressed in terms of its ability to look forward. Uh, you, the media environment a contributor to that, the um, going into passive funds, you're literally investing while looking in the rear view mirror, hoping you don't run into a tree. Uh, you know, even within the hedge fund space, uh, it, it's, you know, people get paid based on the performance of their fund annually. And so, you know, an analyst who makes a good call as measured over five years is going to get fired before that five years occur. Uh, and so we intentionally take a medium term point of view. Uh, all of our underwriting of individual securities is over five years. Uh, we pretend as if we're going to be a forced seller of our positions five years from now, meaning that we don't uh, tribute, we don't act like we're selling to techno optimists. We say, given this, what the business is going to look like five years from now, um, and the cash flow we think the business could generate, what would someone who's going to pay a normal market multiple for cash flow, given the um, margin and capital intensity characteristics of the business, pay for that business? And so um, we we really try to actually be quite conservative in our underwriting. Um, from the pers but we do it over a time frame that we think is appropriate for the duration of the equity market. Uh, technologies that cross cut, cut cross sector are misunderstood, particularly by sector specialists. The automotive analyst just doesn't have the time to figure out how the cost declines in batteries is working, or even to compare it against fuel cells, which we've done a lot of work on. And so they basically rely upon the executives that they talk to, to um, kind of let them know when it's a technology that's reasonable and interesting to pay attention to. Uh, and, and they've been misserved by doing so. And so uh, we assign our analysts by technology rather than by sector, and that like allows Sam, who covers batteries for us, for example, to think about where exactly in the value chain the value is going to accrue. Is it in the utility space? Is it in the renewable space? Is it in kind of the battery component supplier space? Is it the battery manufacturers themselves? Is it at the tier one suppliers? Like where is the cash flow going to accrue as a result of the transition of the drivetrain over to electrification? Disruption of the coronavirus clearly pulled for the adoption curves on a number of our technologies. Companies, like when you, when you go from a blank slate and people are just forced to, they're not just gonna stick with the decisions they've made, they're forced to reevaluate their decisions, how they're operating in the world, disruptive technology tends to win because typically the economics and productivity generation of a disruptive technology is much higher than um, the status quo ante. And so um, kind of the, on top of which, you know, everybody forced into digitization, businesses all having to go online like this, there's a lot of productivity generation you've gotten out of that transition. And 
um, the assets have performed. And so people have poured money in. And so the question is 7 trillion to 14 trillion. Okay, so now it's like 20% of global equity uh, is, is in this technology stack. Is that overvaluing kind of like where the ultimate horizon is? And from our perspective, that's absolutely what our job is to do, is to look at the, both at the technology level and at the individual security level, how do we underwrite our positions to make sure we're providing a reasonable return on capital for our clients measured over a reasonable time horizon within the equity market? Well, the good news is, you know, across our portfolios, especially after the last few days, um, you know, on, on the underwritten positions within our forecast set, we still think we have a lot of inefficiency in the market. Uh, now, I reserve the right to be wrong with my forecast. The way, so everything I'm saying is not a, uh, a promise of return or anything like that. I'm just saying the way in which our five-year price targeting looks is that we have still a, um, you know, over five years, a, a more than double in, in the portfolio. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you go at the technology level, so if you approach it from the top-down level, where we look at our attributed value to each of these 14 technologies within the stack, we think that by 2025, there will be $28 trillion in attributable market cap to these technologies. And then by 2030, roughly 75 trillion. So you can think that it's 75 trillion is basically the size of the global equity market today. So um, you can, a crude way to think about it is like we basically expect if you could somehow get efficient exposure to all companies exposed to these technologies, the value of those exposures would roughly double if you could somehow index it, right? Um, so, um, so that's where I at least take comfort that, um, you know, whatever happens today, I think I'm putting good money to work that will provide outsized return as measured over five years. There's clearly a lot of like signs of misbehavior in the market, broadly speaking, as in the GameStop thing, uh, a lot of retail options activity. Uh, our, our actively traded ETF is being heavily shorted right now, which I, I don't think is a sign of good health, not casting a value judgment against it, but it's like, a you know, and there is clearly like options activity on our actively tra traded ETF. I don't think that's an appropriate way to, to uh, invest in an actively managed fund. Uh, and there is not a, you know, that is what it is, right? Like the way I think about it and the way I think about my own exposure to our funds is, you know, when I'm investing in equities, my time horizon is consistent with an equity length duration, which is not three months. It's, it's like a, at least a business cycle. Like if you are worried about what's gonna happen over the next three months, then you're in the wrong asset class, right? And so like your mix of assets should be what controls against the vol in the equity market. You can look at the total equity market and say, oh, well, you know, it should normalize to a something PE or something. Like, you know, the equity market could be down 30%. I don't know. I, I actually think it's easier to forecast what's gonna happen for us over five years than it is over three months. And I feel confident about the five-year point of view. If you think about the way research and portfolio management interacts, it's we're kind of generating kind of the scoring for the company. And so we have um, four subjective scores we do for each company, plus a thesis risk, plus a, um, our expectations for returns. Uh, and then like, giving guidance on incremental news um, so that the portfolio can be traded tactically relative to what's happening in, in, within the world. And there's no doubt that we have more market impact with our decisions now than we used to. And that has um, benefits and drawbacks, right? So um, the, if we want an allocation in IPO, we can get it. Right, that, that previously was not available to us. We did not have the same attention from you know, investment bankers and management teams that we currently do. Uh, and um, 
because we have like a five-year price target, if there's a price impact on a security that we invest in, because people have seen that we've invested in it and then it gets bid up, you know, we're going to be tacked. We're not going to continue to chase price. We have a, we require a 15% compounded return to put money to work uh, as measured over five years. And, you know, sometimes it'll appreciate beyond that. And, and we have other places to go, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, narrowly um, that uh, initial money in actually the IRR on it is very high <laughs> because you put some money into a position and, and it appreciates meaningfully just on the basis that somebody knows that you've signed off on it with your seal of approval. Um, you know, that, that uh, is what it is. Well, I think the most exciting space is robo taxis. Like I think that the, um, you know, basically the cost per mile to go from place to place has been the same or go from point to point in a car, inflation adjusted has been the same for a hundred years, like 75 cents. And uh, and the Model T, you bought it and you account for all the maintenance and everything else at 75 cents. If you can deliver robo taxi, meaning that uh, cars drive themselves, you ride in the back seat, we think that'll profitably price at 25 cents a mile. Uh, and, um, and so you create, it's this, for one thing, it, it's like a lot of innovation. It takes non-market activity and it turns into market activity. We're all amateur drivers and some of us are very bad at it, right? So you take out that non-market activity that you're not getting paid for and you turn it into a market service layer. So there are, I won't walk through all the math, but it's very easy to underwrite and forecast to um, more than a trillion dollars in operating earnings for the robo taxi platforms that provide that service. And I don't know what you wanna pay in terms of a multiple of operating earnings on a software platform, but the market right now is paying 19, 20 times, well, actually well north of that, but at equilibrium kind of like the 19 times, um, you know, for, for stable platforms. Okay, so then that would suggest a $20 trillion market cap opportunity there. Um, that's in 2030. So it, it's like creating a new sector out of broad cloth, right? And, and right now, if you look within, we classify those within energy storage, if you look at the, the way in which the market's appreciated in the SPAC space, in the ex-Tesla space, it's been in a lot of um, electric vehicle manufacturers that haven't, haven't really produced electric vehicles in a meaningful volume yet. So it's, there's actually been kind of appreciation, I think, in the wrong spot, in part because there's not like clear investable assets tied to that, uh, aside from Tesla, and you can get a stub in Waymo, and, you know, GM has some exposure, but we have some concerns there. So um, the, the, the potential for, for like a monumentally large company uh, in that spot is very high. And, and if you look across our forecasting, across the five technology platforms, the incremental value accrual in, from a growth basis is actually more in the robotics, energy storage, gene sequencing, edi editing, and cryptocurrency space rather than the AI neural net space. And so the, that a lot of people are trying to get innovation by being um, basically uh, allocating to the hyper large cap tech. The, it means they might miss, or at least they're not well positioned yet for some of these vertical exposures that we think are gonna accrue a lot of value within disruptive technology.